Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining our webinar today, The Expanding Role of the General Counsel. Today we'll be hosting a roundtable discussion with two experienced general counsel, Sham Reddy and Matthew Flannery, to discuss how the role and responsibilities of the GC continues to expand. Before I hand this over to my co-hosts and my colleagues, Melba Hughes and Jonathan Wiley, I'd like to run through a brief um, bit of housekeeping. You should all be able to see the screen right now and hopefully hear my voice. All attendees are in listen-only mode for the duration of the presentation, and as a reminder, the call is being recorded. The recording will be available on our website in the next few days. We expect this call to be about one hour, including Q&A. Speaking of Q&A, please submit your text questions and comments using the GoToWebinar console. Just open up the console, type a question, and hit submit. We will take all questions at the end of the discussion, but feel free to submit them at any time. Jonathan's on the Q&A um, in the background, so he will be able to see anything you say. Also, all questions will be anonymous, and we will not share your identity with the rest of the audience. We'll do our best to get to all of them during the presentation. At the close of today's webinar, a survey will pop up on your screen. We hope that you'll take the time to fill it out. It's short and should take one to two minutes tops, and will let us know how we did today, as well as other topics you'd like to hear from us, and also when you'd feel comfortable returning to live events, because I think we're all starting to get a little webinar or Zoomed out. With that said, and without further ado, let me turn this over to my colleagues, Melba and Jonathan, who will set the stage for today's webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melba Hughes, and my colleague, Jonathan Wiley, is um, on one of your um, blocks here. So, Jonathan, do you want to introduce yourself, please? Certainly. Hi, everyone. I'm Jonathan Wiley. I'm Managing Director at Major Lindsay in Africa. Uh, been recruiting for more years than I can remember now and been with MLA for, I think, going on my fourth year. So pleased to be here with everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Jonathan. And again, my name is Melba Hughes. I'm a partner with Major Lindsay in Africa, and I, like Jonathan, work outside of the Atlanta office. Um, I wanted to share with you a little bit of background as to how we landed on this topic. Uh, we, Jonathan and I were working on several GC searches and one of the things that we noticed over time, over the, the last several years, is that increasingly so, the C-suite was asking us to find a general counsel who could take on additional responsibility. So, we saw GCs that had government affairs, and we saw GCs that were managing HR in some cases. And as we took a closer look at this, we realized that with increasing frequency, the GC's office was being called upon to add value in other spaces um, other than just the legal space. Um, Heather Fine and I, did the McDonald's GC search. And one of the things that we learned from our candidate pool was that many GCs were saying, well, what additional responsibilities other than legal is this job going to have? So that pool of candidates wanted to ensure that they had more than just legal and compliance. Um, they wanted government affairs, they wanted communications, they wanted additional responsibilities. And we learned quickly that many candidates, many of our top candidates chose not to move forward um, with that role because they wanted additional responsibilities. So we thought we would spend today um, just exploring that. What has happened? When did this start? Why did it start? What impact it has on careers and things of that nature? So thank you for being with us during your lunch break. Um, we will, um, we have two amazing panelists. We have Matt Flannery and Sham Reddy, and these are two people that I've known for a long time. Jonathan and I have worked with both of them. And at the end of the day, I can't think of better people to explore and discuss the subject matter. So Sham and Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Matt and ask him to introduce himself, and then I'll have Sham introduce himself immediately following. 
Sure. Thank you, Melba. Thank you for the for the kind introduction. Um, and I've enjoyed I've enjoyed getting to sham along the along the way. Um, and thank you as well to Heather. She's really good at this. Yeah. <laughs> Right. You can tell she's she's done it before. She's she's made our our lives a, a lot easier. So, um, I'm Matt Flannery. I'm the chief legal and administrative officer and secretary um, at Icon Automotive, and I've had maybe not the most typical path uh, to to the current role that I'm in. Um, I started my practice at ten years at Jones Day, where I was a hardcore litigator, um, and 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 ninety five percent of what I did was hardcore litigation. Um, I then moved in-house to Cooper Tire, um, again, largely focusing on, on litigation, but we're a small legal department. Uh, you wear many hats. You get to do lots of things. You work very closely with the, bis with the business people, as, as, as many of you are, are aware and feel um, today, and that took me into more of a, uh, more of a business role. Um, that led to my next five years at, at Goodyear, uh, where I made a complete career switch. Um, put the litigation uh, um, skill set behind and, and became the, the embedded business lawyer for the consumer tire group uh, at Goodyear. So it was about a $5 billion business. It was the North America, what you think of, of Goodyear and the blimp, right? It was manufacturing tires, selling tires, distributing all of the things that come with, uh, with that complex, complex business unit. Uh, and then for the last six years, uh, and, and, and again, at, at, at you know my my journey into into the, you know managing functions, non legal functions, really began at Goodyear, where I had the opportunity to do a number of uh, wear wear a number of business hats um, along the way, uh, which led me to my current role. Um, uh, I've been here for six years, uh, and 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 here that. Um, that non lawyer role has expanded um, um, exponentially. So so currently. Um, I oversee the, as Mel mentioned, the HR uh, department. Uh, it's my responsibility. The real estate department um, rolls up to me. Environmental health and safety, um, loss prevention, uh, the mergers and acquisition function, think business development, uh, and and risk management. Um, so I, um, I jokingly say all those all those things that the that the CEO doesn't want to focus on. Personally, he's 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 asked me to uh, asked me to look after. Um, Sham. Oh, by the way, Sham, thank you for having the, one of the few titles that I have seen that is longer than mine. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it, the last time I got a title, um, I guess, change, upgrade, whatever you want to call it, I got a lot of inbounds to that effect. It's like your title just keeps getting bigger <laughs> and bigger and bigger. Uh, so anyway, well, Matt, it, it's been a pleasure meeting you over the last uh, few weeks and preparing for this panel. Melba, thank you so much for uh, asking me to be a part of this it's 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 been ex an exciting road for me to to pick up all these additional responsibilities over the years so it's a real privilege and an honor to be um, sharing uh, sharing that experience with the folks on the call and with each other uh, so I guess for me my background I've also had a very uh, interesting circuitous route I would have never uh, been able to map out uh, my career path if someone had asked me to uh, when I was in law school, I, I, you know, I left law school uh, planning to go work at a big law firm. I started at Kilpatrick. Uh, I worked my way up from being a summer associate all the way through partnership and was a M&A, private equity, uh, venture capital lawyer, did a lot of outsourcing, commercial transaction work, uh, worked for some of the biggest companies in, in the U.S. while also doing uh, fund for you know fund work and a variety of other things on the venture and private equity side, and then uh, early in my partnership, I got a an opportunity, got a call to work in the Obama administration, and you would normally think that lawyers would get called to uh, be in justice or be a U.S. attorney or uh, go into the civil rights division or something like that. Well, I was actually called to take on a business role and lead the General Services Administration in the Southeast, which is a very large, it's, think of it as a shared, the shared services arm of the federal government. So in that role, I had oversight over, I was in eight states, uh, 12 service centers, 44 million square feet of owned and leased real estate, an $8 billion supply chain, uh, a 40,000 vehicle fleet operation, uh, property and personal property disposal, uh, technology, et cetera. And then I was, in addition to running the region, 
I was asked to be on a variety of national uh, initiatives as well, whether it be serving on the national labor negotiations team or building centers of excellence around procurement. Uh, so that was my first opportunity to truly wear a business hat uh, where I was leading and managing a large organization. And it's the closest thing you can get to in a business and government in that it's fee for service, billion two in revenue, had a you know quarter of a billion dollar budget. Uh, and you know, you run it like a PL. The major difference, and I would and I would say there are significant differences between it and the private sector, and that's number one, you don't have to worry about going bankrupt. Uh, so you can you can swing for the fences and drive real change in a short period of time. Um, and then secondly, uh, you're not you're not I mean, you're trying to save money and and bring value to the U.S. taxpayer. Uh, but if you're generating too much profit, then then there's something wrong with your cost <laughs> cost structure to some degree. Um, but in any event, it was a great great experience. But when I when I as I was coming out, rather than go back to a law firm, I really wanted to go corporate. And uh, my first job was uh, a general counsel over at Euromax, or what's now known as Omnimax Holdings. And in that that role, like Matt, I was brought in as the GC, the first GC for that company. But then very quickly, I was given real estate, fleet, HR, IT, et cetera. And then I came to Blue Links two years later, came in as the general counsel. And during my time here, I have I've built out the pricing and sales excellence teams. I have HR, real estate, uh, risk management, legal. I'm the corporate secretary, and I do, like Matt, all the corporate development, M&A work. And in between, we did a big acquisition, a billion three acquisition, and then I was asked to lead the integration of that. And so I would say that in all of these situations, uh, I've been lucky. I've had great advocates who've literally just said, you know, Sham, do this, do that. Or if I said I'd like to do this, they said absolutely, just go do that. <laughs> so it's been a it's been a great ride. I've enjoyed it, and uh, I do think it's something that lawyers are being called upon more and more often to uh, take on more responsibilities. Thank you, um, thank you both. And um, I'm going to direct this question first to Matt. Um, Matt, you have listed a number of functions that you um, personally manage and lead. Um, are there other functions that you're seeing? Where else are you seeing um, GCs being asked to lead? Yeah, it, it, it's it's not one size fits all, uh, right? And and I have seen many many varieties of this, both in in folks that I bump up against in in the legal world and business world that I live in, in friends and in, in colleagues, um, you know, and, and at least I began to be cognizant of it several years ago. And initially I would see things that, things that really touched the law department, things that the law department are going to be involved in, uh, in any way like, uh, you know, risk management or, or environmental health and safety, um, sometimes, you know, public affairs, um, 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 those sorts of things. Um, privacy certainly, um, but I've seen that more over time, and I don't think that 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 Sham and I are outliers. I, I see more and more of my colleagues being asked to take on big substantive functions. Right? Think of HR. That is a that is that is one of the most critical functions that a business has. Right? I I, I think of I think of finance and HR as two of the most critical functions that that touch touch an organization. So um, I think it's different. Um, a little bit different in public companies, maybe than private companies. I think it's different um, 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 depending on your board, depending on your CEO, depending on your relationships. So I've seen it all manners and all manners and, and varieties. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I would. I mean, if you look at all the various things that Matt and I have done, it, it, that's testament to there not being one size fits all. I mean, I was asked to build out our pricing and sales excellence teams. And that's not necessarily something you would typically ask a GC to do. But then I've also led risk management, which seems a little bit more straightforward. So I think I think a lot. There are a few things I would I would add to what Matt said. Number one, um, it you know if you have a board and a CEO who truly trusts you and believes in you and 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 views your skill set as very versatile. That being what we're trained as lawyers to be, analytical organized, thoughtful, collaborative. I mean, the, all of the traits and skills that make a, a general counsel really effective 
uh, can be applied in different in different uh, areas of the business. So long as you have the interpersonal skills and you know those sorts of things, right? You can develop a followership. They're more likely to expand your role. The second thing is, you know, to your point early on, Melba, where you talked about lots of clients now asking for more business experience. There are some industries that probably wouldn't want a general counsel having an expanded role, you know, something that's highly regulatory. So let's just take a, a, a financial services company like a, a JP Morgan or a Truist. I mean, it's a very, it's a very compliance risk management focused league. And so in that case, in that industry, it might be rare for a general counsel to take on more roles because they want them laser focused on the risk management uh, aspect of the business. So, you know, to Matt's point, it just, it depends on the company, private, public, you know, what the board is like. The other thing that I would point out is, I think the one thing that shouldn't be lost on people is corporate strategy. So for example, let's say a business or a CEO says, you know what, I we're, we're going to be laser focused on growing sales in this market. Um, or in these markets and international, whatever. Well, part of the strategy might be, you know, I need to redo my work structure because so that I can line, align all my efforts around that key corporate strategy. Well, who on my team has the capacity <laughs> to, to basically, you know, help me manage all my direct reports? Well, you know what? I'm going to give Matt three more teams who would otherwise report directly to me so that I can focus on sales because that's the highest and best use of my time. And I think in a lot of instances, CEOs, they, they develop these close trusted relationships with their GCs and their CFOs. And, and, and so those two positions in particular can be great positions to give more responsibility to. And it, and it comes down to that relationship you have with your CEO um, to, to help facilitate that extra, uh, those extra opportunities. Fantastic. Matt, you had mentioned, I think, um, when we had been discussing previously, there was a couple of, I think, two probably key attributes that you thought of um, that were necessary. One of them was understanding the business. I, I confess I've forgotten the other one. <laughs> Do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. So, um, um, Sham is right. So the training that we get as lawyers is a tremendous foundation upon which to build, to be, to become a business leader. Um, you know, that attention to detail organization, um, you know, the, the knowledge of and always being guided by, by the law and, and by issues of risks, but then to, to, to really become successful as a trusted business partner, there, there, there are a couple of things couple of skill sets that I would suggest that, that folks um, think about, or at least let me say it this way, things that I have focused on and thought about for, for myself. Um, you know, no, number one, first and foremost, you know, know the business. Know the business cold, know it inside out, know the strategy. Um, um, uh, you know, the, the, the CFO can be your best friend um, in, in understanding the business strategy. In order, in order for you to be a business partner, you have to know exactly um, the strengths of the business, the weakness of the business, the, the threats, the opportunities, the competitors, uh, you know, and, and, and what your, what your, you know, what your operating plan is for this year at a granular level, what, what's your three-year plan, what's your five-year year plan. Um, so I'd say first and foremost is, is, you know, understand, um, understand the business. Financial acumen um, is, is important as well. You may very well may be asked to, to own a P&L, or at least you're a big part uh, of someone else's p and l so um, you know having some financial savvy is um, is, is definitely critical. Um, two other things I would give you one is um, really focus on being a good manager of people right in order to lead a function that's as complex as as h r or or as real estate in order to give your your ceo your cFO your board confidence and comfort in you leading other teams um, you need to be a really good manager of, of people and and that's the, that that may be the hardest managing people is difficult and it's hard work and it takes time it takes investment uh, it's it's hiring people right it's setting the organizational structure for that department whether it be ehs or loss prevention or or whatever department it is um, creating the right design to make the organization successful right Making sure that you're hiring the right people 
Um, but then it just, then the work really begins. It's, it's engaging those people. It's leading those people. It's retaining those people. Um, um, you know, it's, it's when good things happen, you stand back and get out of the way and say to the board, look at how great this team did, right? Look, look, look how, look, look what a great job, you know, they did on this particular success. And then when something bad happens, it's doing just the opposite, right? It's jumping in front of the bullet and saying, that's my responsibility, right? That was, that was on me. Um, um, you know, here's what we're, what we're going to do to fix it. And here's how we're going to, we're going to, we're going to learn from it and, and move forward. So, you know, and, and, uh, you know, some lawyers in their prior careers, you know, think about if you're, if you're at, you know, a big firm or a small firm, you, you're not asked to manage teams of people. You may on projects, right? You may be working on a big case and manage people on that project, but you're not responsible for the careers. Um, um, so I think, you know, running, being an excellent manager of the law department is, is a good way of showing, you know, retaining people and, 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 and hiring the right people and structuring in the right way is, is, is a, is a good way of going, of taking the step to show the CEO that you're ready for more challenges. And, the, and then the last point I'll, I'll mention is, is process orientation. And yes, um, I, I am, I am, this is driven from my, you know, 13 years at manufacturing companies, right. At, at, at Goodyear and Cooper tire, but, you know, thinking about things like um, how to bring lean six sigma principles into the administrative functions is really really important and and i know that was a lot of words but it's as simple as eliminating waste um, and 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 using tools to manage projects you can there are fancy tool you know terms like value stream mapping and kaizen and pokio you don't need to know any of that it's just using the principles of being process oriented which means being, being a lawyer being organized have a tracker um, um, monitor, um, have the right metrics in place, monitor those metrics and, and react accordingly when you see things, um, you know, things moving in the metrics. So um, I'll, I'll pause there and, and, and ask Sam to comment because I know we, we have, we have uh, all different, different backgrounds on this and Sam and I think very uh, similarly about a lot of things, but he always says smarter stuff than I do. So <laughs> no, I, I don't think that's true, but <laughs> I was just going to say, I couldn't have said it any better myself. I mean, I mean, there are a couple things that um, I would love to piggyback on. So I do, you know, again, the purpose of this call, right, is expanding the GC role and everything Matt said becomes even more important. So the more the more things you have on your plate, the more departments you're managing, the more important it is to be process oriented and to have trackers and have metrics and so on and so forth. I mean, that or those organizations organizational skills, um, they just have a compounding benefit to them, the more uh, responsibility you get. And, and so, you know, as part of that, I would, I would say, you know, kind of stepping back a little bit, you know, I think one thing that, that lawyers do uh, just by virtue of their role is they're trained to listen, right? You have to get all the facts. You have to go, go in search or pursuit of knowledge in order to uh, analyze any given issue. And so as a result of that, when you're out with a business, I think that particular skill is a very valuable one. Because, you know, if you think about it, if you're a salesperson or you've come up through marketing or so on and so forth, you're kind of wired to just start talking and start promoting and sharing your knowledge and so on and so forth. Whereas with, for lawyers, we're trained to first listen, get all the facts. And that's a skill that I think is can be very, very valuable. The second thing is, as you as you get um, again, as you go from the GC to taking on HR, risk management, pricing, integration, corp development, etc., there's a point at which you've got so much on your plate that the management aspects evolve into leadership and all the things that, and they're very distinct skill sets. You can be a great manager and a horrible leader, or you could be a terrific leader but horrible manager. And so I think at the end of the day, the bigger, the more responsibilities you get, the more important it becomes that, you know, as Matt was alluding to, you hire the right people because you cannot necessarily be in a position to manage every single aspect, i.e., you know, as a lawyer, we tend to mark up agreements. But if you're running like six or seven departments or five or six departments, you probably don't have the bandwidth to be marking up an agreement as if you were training a first year, which means you need more like a seventh year 
or whatever level lawyer. So you're not doing that. And then of course the leadership aspect is uh, being able to develop that followership, investing in people, helping them grow, coaching them, helping them, you know, advance in the company, advocating for them, et cetera. And then the, and then the last point I want to make is, and I, I can't emphasize this enough. And that is that, it's so important that out of the blocks, if you want to take on more responsibility, that you are confident, that you truly believe that your analytical, interpersonal, and other skills that have made you a great lawyer are versatile and can be used across the organization. And once you feel that way, then raise your hand, take on every assignment, build your internal network, uh, and work with folks all across the organization to be a business counselor beyond the normal legal stuff. And then have your executive sponsors go out and I can't tell you how many times there's some business thing going on. And my CEO says, you know what? I want you to bring Sham in on that. Just bring him in. Y'all collaborate. Y'all negotiate the deal, work together. And it, and it could be something that has normally really is sort of outside my lane, you know, such as work with Sham to figure out the best business arrangement to, to purchase a hundred new tractor trailers. You know, before the decision is even made, go through the process with the CFO to make the business case, that kind of thing. Uh, so I think those executive sponsors and peers can be really valuable to you if that's, again, if it's something you want to do in terms of taking on more responsibility. Yeah, I think, I, I, I think, I think that's great. And l let me, let me go back and layer one more thing on, on the process, because I know we're both process guys and, and, and in, in my world and the world that the worlds that I have lived in in prior lives, it's so extremely important. Um, you know, I was given the opportunity to build a new law department here when I came here six years ago and I drove my lawyers absolutely crazy um, by this, by focus on process and metrics. And, you know, and, and, and one thing I would suggest is if you're new to process or you're, you're, you're looking to go down this path of expanding the role, you know, get comfortable with KPIs and, and live them in your, in your own department. Um, you know, my lawyers thought I was, um, I, I was crazy when I, I would require of each of them to come up with a monthly KPI. They're like, we're, we're, we're lawyers. We like words. <laughs> those, those are numbers. I don't want to, what, what, what do you mean? I'm a litigator. Yeah. Well, you're a litigator. Here's 10 different things you can do. I want to know your cycle time. I want to know your, your, your cases settled, your average, your average settlements. Um, um, you, you know, how many settled, how many tried, there's, there's a thousand metrics. And, and once that person got their arms around that, they saw that it wasn't just something that Flannery wanted them to do, but it became really valuable to them because then they could manage their large, their large docket of, of work. You do that a few times throughout your organization and light bulbs start going on. People now want to do it because they're better at their job, um, um, because of it. Um, so it's pretty exciting to, to watch to watch that. That's how the business world acts, right? So so we as lawyers who want to who want to you know be helpful in that world, we we should we should think the same way. The other thing that Shan, that Sham said is great, and I was I was laughing is it's the project. So if you want to walk down this path, be open to any project that comes your way, right? I mean I've I've overseen corporate headquarter moves, I've overseen um, discrete business projects like like Sham mentioned. I didn't. I didn't um, buy trailers, but it was something something similar. Uh, and and you know, being a being a good business partner um, with with you know your knowledge of the law, um, but your brain and your ability to create creatively solve problems will really open up will really open up um, your organization's willingness to let you in into that world. But I have to emphasize that part. It is creative problem solving. Um, you know, one of the things I like to say is the law department is where where issues come to die, right? So you, you bring us problems and, and we'll find you solutions. Um, um, you know, I, I always jokingly say, unless it's illegal, immoral, or patently stupid, um, I try to find a way not to say no. And if I have to say no, then I haven't been involved with the business early enough to know where they want to go um, so that I can guide them and advise them and nudge them to the right path where there isn't a full stop, no. Um, 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 so again, you know, as Sham said, build those relationships, ask thoughtful questions. You know, if you're in senior leadership team meetings, um, you know, ask a question um, that, that shows you're interested. Um, the, the business leaders that I, I have worked with have always been very appreciative that they have a lawyer who's really interested in the business and really wants the business to succeed and really wants to be at their, 
you know, shoulder to shoulder with them, helping to helping to solve problems. Obviously, our roles as general counsels come first. We're protectors of the shareholders, and and you know, we need to be on top of the legal issues and risk management issues of so the business that doesn't make mistakes. But beyond that, it's that creative problem solving that I think really can open up a lot of opportunities for folks looking to go down this path. I wanted to just um, tackle onto that because you alluded to it very briefly there, Matt, and we had um, a question come in sort of in advance of this webinar, which related to privilege, attorney privilege, and um, how with this expanded role, the lawyer kind of juggles that, right? Because you had mentioned obviously protecting the shareholders and things of that nature. How do they juggle that uh, whilst they... Um, you know, have responsibility for all these other functions as well. Yeah, so that's that's a, a critical aspect, and it probably keeps both Sham and I up um, all the time. And and you know, there there are a couple of basic core principles that I try to follow. I always try to be mindful, not just day by day, but minute by minute. What hat am I wearing? Um, am, am I am I participating in, in this meeting as um, the person that that is putting together a business deal and negotiating the deal? Or am I wearing my hat as as the owner of the function who's who's papering the deal? Um, because they're they're very different. Um, um, so I always try to be mindful of what role I'm in. I always try to be very mindful of of how I communicate, um, only including privilege and confidential banners and stamps where it's absolutely appropriate. The last thing in the world I want to do is have have a pure business document to which no credible claim of privilege would attach and have it say privilege and confidential. Um, and that's that's partially on me. That's partially on my team. And 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 I also work with that very closely with my clients. I I I typically have very close relationship with my clients. And um, you know, over the years, they're very good about um, about knowing when they're asking me a question as a lawyer. And and they'll even proactively put you know privilege and confidence in the red line, or they'll say things like, "Hey, man, I'm reaching out to you for some legal advice here, uh, my friend." Um, all of those things can can be helpful. Um, but the two worlds are very separate, and it's 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 hard at times not to blend them. But it's something that you just you just need to think about think about daily. Um, Sham, what do you think? Yeah, I I agree. Um, I, you know, I've been in a situation where in my previous company, which was a billion dollar private manufacturer, I was a general counsel of one, and it was really hard in that instance. Uh, and you still you know basically follow all the the advice that that uh, Matt just shared, but. When you have team members, you actually have the ability to to be a lot more. It's it's easier to manage through, and it just requires you to be more thoughtful about it. So with litigation, you know, it's it makes sense to have my senior counsel litigation and compliance involved every step of the way. I also have the same thing, Matt, where the where clients will specifically say, "I'm looking. I need some legal advice," which is really helpful. Uh, and so, you, you know, you just you just manage through it, but you have to the first step is making sure you're aware of it and you're conscientious and then you take proactive steps. Um, but I, I have taken full advantage of my team, the legal team in those those areas where it's it's so critical and clear to make sure that it's completely defensible as to where that privilege has been established. So. I'm going to go off script a little bit because um, I had this sensation when we were prepping um, for this call that the general counsel role is a full-time executive level job. And when you add all these other functions, <laughs> um, when do you sleep? How do you, how do you, how has your life changed? with these additional responsibilities and, and how do you manage and lead that? Jim, do you wanna start? Sure. Oh, well, I'm probably a terrible role model. Uh, I, I do work a lot, especially last year. I mean, it was, I was also, I have a background in public health too. And so last year I was in charge of our COVID-19 response. And, and that was something, there was no written playbook. And ultimately I had to do that from scratch, figure everything out, you know, on the fly, leverage my network to get data in advance of when the public would find out. I mean, all those sorts of things in order to respond. And that coupled with, 
you know, basically doing everything we could to shore up the balance sheet, generate cash, and keep the company alive. And so those were 100-hour weeks for months on end. And, you know, you started feeling grateful for 90 and 80-hour weeks. Uh, I would say that, you know, just putting aside, I think the best way to describe it is if you put aside the, lo the long hours and all the things I enjoy doing, I would say it forces you to make trade-offs. Um, you just, you have to. And if you're just, if you're just doing one thing, you might have a, let's say you're, you're just the general counsel. You might have a list of 10 things that you want to do with many of those things being nice to have. They're great. They're completely defensible. They're amazing ideas. But if you're doing like 20 different things or you have multiple sets of responsibilities, or if you're or if you're responsible, even though you have individual budgets for each team, uh, because you have a, a wider scope of responsibility, you might say, you know what, I need to invest in HR this year. And so I'm going to give up in legal to do it in order to make my case. Or I'm going to roll out a training program for these things around legal compliance. Well, this year that might be a good thing but I'm going to actually wait till the following year because I need to go deal with X, Y, and Z on these other initiatives. So you end up finding yourself making trade-offs. Whereas if you're just the general counsel, you're not really forced with making trade-offs in the same way you would be otherwise. And so that's ultimately, I know it sounds, it's hard to kind of conceptualize, but I think the more you have, then you're just forced to reallocate your time and your energy and your resources very differently. And the more scope or responsibility you have, the more closely you are connected to the overall corporate strategy because you're forced to, I mean, there's no choice. Um, so that's, that's what I would say is you just, and then the more, the longer you do it and the more you do it, the more, the better able you are to make those trade-offs. And sometimes you wrestle with the decisions and they're very challenging and they're hard. And, and, and especially in those instances where you're having to make, when you're dealing with existential crises and you're dealing with furloughs or elimination of positions, risks, et cetera, which many companies dealt with last year, Blue Links included. So it's it can be hard. Yeah, we have we have very we have very similar eyes and very similar thinking on this. I I I too was asked to head the COVID response um, for for the family of of companies that I look after, and it was it was there was no playbook as as you said we 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 built from we built from scratch and there were you know eight or ten or twelve different um, work streams that went into just that and you know all the other planning that that we had done as a business and me as 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 a leader of various functions got put on pause while we, while we navigated that. Um, but um, I like a lot of what, of what Sham said as, as a leader of multiple functions, I, I try to have a master plan for each department. Okay. Where is the law department going to be one, two, three, five years, real estate, HR there, you know, always in various um, 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 stages of, of maturity and, and development. And you always have to make some time to take yourself out of the day to day and the tactical and, and, and be the leader. Right, which means setting the strategy for the department and the strategy that I have for each department has to lock it be in lockstep with the company's larger business strategy. Um, so some of the things that I've focused on, right, right or wrong, is 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 you know building the plan for each department and then taking it up a level and seeing as Sham says, you have to make choices. So I can't focus on everything every, every day. What's most important? And you pick pieces and parts from each department. So that's one. Two is um, what, what I mentioned earlier, um, really getting good people. Um, um, you know, I, I have a functional leader of each of the functions that, that, uh, that I oversee that with maybe one or two exceptions. Um, I hired and I, I hired them to be a cultural fit. I hired them to be subject matter experts and, and it's my job to give them the tools, um, and the resources to be successful. And I'm there to help them. I'm there to clear roadblocks. Um, but I, I'm there principally to make them successful. Um, um, as a lawyer, I have, uh, you know, I have the ability to roll up my sleeves and dig in tremendously to the details where I need to, when I need to, but that's not my management style. I don't, that's not where I prefer to be unless I need to be there. So it's getting the right people in place, 
empowering them to be successful, but making sure that each department has the foundations and the building blocks to be a solid department, right? So again, I mentioned I, I, I was asked to create a law department from from scratch. So I started like Sham in his last role as a as a you know one lawyer department, and now I have quite a robust um, department as as uh, you know the, our our company has grown um, um, exponentially. And just in the law department, for example, I started with a roadmap. What is you know the goal was to be um, a best in class technology le- leveraged law department, right? And and you know so how do we get from there to here? So one of the things that I do at my weekly staff meetings is is I I have a tracker that focuses on not the nitty gritty things that each of the each of the lawyers is doing, but what are the foundational building blocks of the department that we're working on. And it started with the very basics, like having a contract lifecycle management system in place, having having e billing in place, having a a, a modern uh, uh, record retention um, in place, a, a document management system in place. Some companies will will want to think about uh, board board software, um, and that was a journey that we worked on over the years. Um, you know, and now several years into it, I have a very mature and experienced law department with a very high um, high level of retention folks that have been around for a long long time and they know their stuff and they're good at it and i trust them um, and so the law department doesn't take a, a, a ton of my direct day-to-day management because it runs because i hired good people and, they, and they, they they know what they're doing and then you try to replicate that through each through each department um, and and when it works it, it 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 feels great and and it does give you the ability to um, um, you know, not work the hundred hour weeks like, like we were all working during COVID. Yeah, I would, I would, I, I tell you what, I'm in the same boat. I feel like my law department, again, this just goes to the point I made earlier about lawyers, especially, you know, presumably all the ones on this call are just inherently very, some of the most talented people you'll find in court and organizations. And in my, just like Matt, my law department, I've got two highly accomplished both two highly accomplished people who've been well-trained at the big law firms who are very resourceful, very talented, really smart, self star I mean, for them, it's, 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 it's great. It's not as uh, challenging. And although I have great teams in all the other areas, some, some or areas are just more uh, by their very nature, take a lot more time and, and HR is one of them, for example, just because it's people, right? So anything that involves people, whether you're doing compensation planning, you're doing merit, you're doing nine boxing, you're doing, you know, hire, whatever, it's a, it, it's very, it's just emotional, right? People are deeply connected to it and all the decisions associated with it. It's less transactional. And as a result, it takes a lot more of a leader's time, I think. And, it, and at the same time, though, it's really rewarding and it's, it's interesting, it's engaging and you can feel the impact very quickly. And by the way, you feel if the consequences can be very great as well. And so it's again, it just depends on the on the uh, is as you're allocating and reallocating uh, some some groups, some efforts, some topics require more time than others. Absolutely. Jonathan, you want to ask the next question? We had a question come in to the chat. Let me just pull it up. One role I've started noticing more lately is a CEO slash CLO advisor or executive advisor or chief of staff type positions. Uh, do you have thoughts on the return of investment on these functions as GCs take on expanded roles? Yeah. So is is that and and I only caught part of the question. Is that question going toward those those uh, COO chief of staff being assumed by the general counsel or or as standalone positions? It looks to me as if it's in addition to the GC function that that they're taking on these additional CLO advisor or executive or chief of staff type type positions. Yeah. So I, um, Sham, I'll start with this one. One 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 thing I would say is. It depends on the company, and and it depends on your business, and 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 it depends on on the leader. In 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 the situations I've been in in the past, that chief operating officer 
um, um, role um, is is not as much of a of a mesh for a lawyer's background as um, as some of the other things that Cham that Cham and I do. Um, um, you know, as as you think about career progression, you go from GC to some of the administrative uh, functions like like we've been talking about. That might be a next step is to the COO. But it really depends on on the job and the person. Like I, I have a where I'm at now is a very complex operational environment, um, um, and and um, it would be a less natural progression for me in this particular environment to have done that first. Yeah, I I would agree. I mean, I the COO position in particular. I mean, it's a true operating role and is is not something you would just do that. I mean, there's really you wouldn't do anything else. At least in our organization, for sure. In my view, I view the CAO role. CAO role is like the COO for administrative functions. Um, it's basically yep. everything the CFO doesn't have, and you just kind of divide it up accordingly. Uh, I, the chief of staff role, I, I would. There are obviously formal chief of staff roles. Depending on the company, they could be uh, a succession plan for the CEO role, uh, and it's specific to that, uh, or it could be more of a like an FP&A role, who's a chief of staff, who's really supporting the CEO, like a dedicated person who can help managing meetings, pulling data, et cetera, and then anywhere in between. I think a better way to think about it, quite frankly, is, is something that Matt and I've talked about before, and that is the GC role in particular, especially with more and more expanded scope, you end up being like a right-hand person of the CEO. And so, um, Conceptually, it feels like you're a chief, of, like you're a chief of staff or whatnot, to the CEO or to the CFO, quite frankly, because you've built this trusted relationship, and they turn to you for advice all the time in in the context of whether it has to do with succession planning or it has to do with business or legal, uh, and so on and so forth. And that that to me is, at the end of the day, what's made my job so rewarding more so than let's say a COO is, at least in the in the examples I've come across with people I know, it's just this feeling like you're a right-hand person. Uh, and that's 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 just a great feeling. You know, a former a CEO I came across with uh, a few years ago, he described his CFO and, and general counsel as his sword and shield, depending on the situation. <laughs> You know, and I thought that's a really yeah. cool metaphor. I mean, and it's nice to be in that position, which the general counsel or CAO role affords you. Um, Absolutely. So, Sham, how how often how often do you talk to your CEO? Oh, yeah, that's clearly a leading question, and it's all the <laughs> time. I mean, right, literally right, multiple times a day, and yeah. at night, and and it's it's and on it's great. I mean, I. I love it when my phone rings and my seat because it, it means he needs me for something important. And and whereas I don't think there's any other position um, pro, who probably gets as many where he has that many interactions with the CEO for sure. Yeah, same same experience in in multiple prior roles that 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 I have had. And and you know I think a key part of that is relationship building, right? So I'm I'm sure your CEO trusts you implicitly because you get stuff done. And you solve problems in a in a creative way, and you bring a a, a, a slightly different thinking and skill set um, than the CE, CEO brings. Um, and I think that's what really makes this role the most rewarding and powerful is is that you know not just here but in prior places I I get involved in everything. I know about everything, which makes me a better lawyer because I know about it up front. Um, and goes back to you know two key things that they take away from this is, is number one relationship building right with your CFO and your CEO and, and, and your board and creative problem solving right right, right. not not just saying no um, um, but figuring out the right way of, of doing something that accomplishes the business objectives while of course properly manage managing managing the risk um, um, but yeah, it's it's. I mean, that's that's the most rewarding part of my job. Is is I, I we're in separate cities right now, but I, you know, in historically, I've talked to my CEOs multiple times a day. Mm -hmm. We just had another. Uh, sorry, Melba, go on ahead. Jonathan, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I I would be remiss if I didn't get this question in because we are search consultants on the side of the screen. Me and Jonathan. Um, 
but how uh, how how are you imagining that your marketability is being impacted um, going forward with these additional responsibilities? Are you getting paid more money? Um, are you more particular about what would attract you away from your roles? Talk to me about those things. Um, sure. I you want me to? I can start. Uh, sure. Hold on, well, let me make sure my camera just like moved. Okay, there we go. So we can see you. Yeah, so I would say, I know for me personally, um, you know, my compensation has definitely gone up with uh, additional responsibilities. And it really jumped from when I went from GC to CAO. But I think the better way to think about it is the, the, the main thing is when you take on more responsibilities, then it's a lot easier for the company to pay you outside their normal comp philosophy of the 50th percentile or the median, at least in publicly traded companies. They typically adopt a philosophy that gets reported in the proxy statement that says, we're going to pay in the median relative to our peers. Uh, and that's our compensation philosophy. Well, obviously, if you've got, you, if you've got top tier talent, you wanna be able to compensate them more uh, if, if it's justified. And so I think in my case and in other folks I've talked to who've taken on expanded roles, they end up being compensated in the higher percentiles of the distribution range. Uh, and and the, the extra responsibilities actually help justify that. I mean, they're pro in and of themselves, they probably warrant it, but once you start throwing on additional things and it becomes a lot more defensible. So I think you know, so then you start getting paid in the 90th percentile. And what's what's interesting is that what it ends up doing, and I know, at least in the interactions I've been involved in, part of it is they, the board and, and the board and the CEO, by doing in that, they're also making it a lot more difficult for you to get poached. Because yeah. they're, because when other, and this has happened to me, I mean, invariably every time i get called for something and then i walk through my compensation package they're like um okay uh, you know it's it's nice talking to you <laughs> and, and they're very intentional about it i mean i have these, these conversations i mean all of a sudden what it does is it puts you into this okay well now your your peer group anyone is in that sort of up to 10 billion dollar publicly traded company it's hard to compete I mean, they're just not going to be able to compete. Then you start getting into the 20 to 25 billion plus. Then, then from a uh, public company standpoint, now you're in a different world where then all of a sudden it's like, you know, that's a really good opportunity. You should go take that. I mean, that's that's kind of it's a strategy. It's a mitigation strategy that they also get the benefit of. So, I do think, you know, the more and more responsibility you take on. Uh, it does it does put you in a better position from a compensation standpoint, uh, but at the same time, it's it's defensible, it's justifiable. And again, these are for publicly traded companies where they are paying very close attention to what the market dynamics are, and then they have the comp consultants, you know, kind of stand behind it because uh, they're just multiple layers of of uh, protection, I guess, or accountability, if you will. Thanks, Jim. I I think that's I think that's well said. I don't I don't have much more to add on top of that other than you know, absolutely you're more marketable with 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 the skill set. Um, folks are intrigued by it. Um, in 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 my experience, I think the one thing to, um, um, you know, potentially be careful of depending on how far down the path you go is is you may get the question, do you really want to be a lawyer anymore? Right. Yes. Right. That has absolute that has absolutely come up. And honestly, I, I think that you know it's one thing when you're in your own organization and you've built up a lot of goodwill. When you're when and, and again, I I assume, I'm thinking this just sort of how dynamics work, especially when you're in HR and you get a bird's eye view of that, is when you're going into a if you're interviewing for let's say a general counsel only role in another company and you're interviewing with a team, and that team is looking at you going, hmm. This, this per, you know, you're like, let's say you're the CHRO and all of a sudden you're interviewing Matt for the next GZ position and he's probably sitting there going, 
wait a second, if we hire Matt, is it possible that I'm going to start reporting to Matt instead of the CEO? <laughs> no, right. I mean, I'm serious. I right. mean, those are the kinds of things. I mean, once you decide to go down this path to take on more responsibilities, there's a lot of reward. But again, it's all about fit in terms of what you do at your current company and what the opportunities are elsewhere. Well, and, and the answer to the question is, uh, you know, you know it, it, at least if, if you know where I ask that ask that question, is that doing all of this other stuff has made me a better lawyer. It does, uh, yeah. Because I understand, I understand the pressures of the business. I have to make business decisions while while considering the legal piece. I wear that hat in in many circumstances, and it, you know, before I bring legal advice to the CEO. I've typically already thought through the problem the way that he's going to think about it and have already had the answers for the questions he's going to ask me because I've already asked them of myself. Um, so I do think I do think that living in that world does make you a much more effective lawyer and it gives you a better sense of what do we need to focus on given our limited resources. Um, you know, what must we focus on? What uh, would be nice to focus on and what, you know, it's good to think about, but that's not that's not that's not a place where I need to spend a whole lot of time. Well, and I would and and you know you made this you alluded to this. It's sort of the more you take on, you know, it could create opportunities or take away. You know, earlier on I said, you know, if it's a highly regulated like pharma or financial services, I don't think I would be a good fit for that. You know, on the other hand, yeah. you know, I'm getting I've gotten you know three calls over the last six months to take on corporate development positions and fortune you know, companies where you're just doing m a you're not even in the legal world anymore. You are the head of corporate development reporting to the CEO or the CFO. So there are, again, it can open doors, it can keep you down the same path, or it might, it might close some. But I think the, the key is, well, what are you most interested in today? Like, right. what brings you so a lot of joy? And, and I love the business and legal aspects of of my role. It just, it's just a lot more fun. I mean, it's exciting. Every day is exhilarating. I'm, I'm going to let Jonathan wrap up because believe it or not, it's 1259. Um, but, and we could go on and talk forever. Um, but I want to say that word joy, I hear it both from, from Sam as well as from Matt, the joy of doing the jobs. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. You can hear the enthusiasm and the excitement. So um, thank you both very much for, for spending the time talking to us. And thank you to everyone who, who tuned in. We really appreciate you joining. And um, thank you for sharing your insights, Sham and Matt. I'll pass it over to Heather. Yep, I just want to say this was great. Um, I knew it was going to be good when we did the prep call last week, but this was really good. And I was hoping we would get like a pure conversation and we did. So Thanks to everybody who's joined us today. Um, special thanks to my colleagues, Melba and Jonathan, who I haven't seen in so long and I miss, and Matt and Sham, thank you so much. You guys were a delight and this was wonderful, um, as well as the entire Southeast in-house council recruiting team for helping me market this. Um, as a reminder, at the end of the webinar, a brief survey will pop up on your screen. Um, send us what other um, topics you'd like to hear from us, whether it be in person or on a webinar, and hopefully I will be planning my next dinner for the Southeast team soon in one of our cities and this time get to meet Matt and Sham in person in Atlanta at Horseradish or whatever it's called right now, the Horseradish Grill. So, <laughs> um, so thank you guys. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday and thanks. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Enjoy. Thanks, Heather.